Yeah, it's Teacher Talk coming to you live from the same spot it always comes from, my office. Yeah. Um, I hope you guys take note of the Simpsons poster behind me. Simpsons is sweet. Um, this is Stand Up Nation, so you guys don't care about TV. Um, all right, so I'm here to talk to you about Margaret Cho. Um, there's a lot to talk about. I'm always interested when I teach this class, like, just the, I guess, vibe. Every class is different. Every group of students is different. And they respond and react to comedians in different ways. And you can, you know, I've taught it this long enough to kind of predict um, pretty accurately, but sometimes it just, it's surprising. Um, I'm surprised, unless you're all just lying to me in the comments. When you say, I really like this comedian, um, don't do that if you are. You don't have to like him. Um, but I was a little bit surprised by the overwhelming support of Margaret Cho and her whole thing. I guess it's a more contemporary voice for sure. Um, most of the stand up of hers that we watched was from the two at least 2000s. Um, I, th I think the one where she's in like the pink, like the long skirt and the top, I think that was from like 2000, I think. So whatever. Um, so yeah, I just want to, again, you guys know how this goes, those of you who watch. Uh, I'll go over my notes, and then I'll, some of which came up in class, we talked about in class, and then I'll go through your comments. Um, so, Margaret Cho, I, the first thing I wrote was, yet another fuck it moment, right? Seized and uh, made the most of, in this, in this case. And for, you know, for... Margaret Cho, the fuck it moment was her whole TV show, right? And we talked about this, like the American dream and what happens when you think, when you get there thinking it's one thing and it's the complete opposite, right? And all she wanted to do her whole life was be a stand-up comedian and get a TV show and be, you know, be an actor and this Asian American actor. And she gets there and it's this you know, it's just this nightmare. It's not. It's nothing like it's supposed to be, um, and that the story of that whole situation is very powerful, and um, at times it's tough to hear. You know, um, so but she had the fuck it moment, and it was like. She was at the point with, she has this show where she's like, I can continue to try to conform and be who everyone wants me to be. And by everyone, she basically means white America, right? Disney, the whole ABC thing. Um, I can continue to do that and really struggle emotionally and mentally and physically, but be the star and, you know, live the dream, or I can, as who said this, um, Jason mentioned this, she said it, um, I will succeed as myself, that whole kind of epiphany, like, there's your choice, there's your fuck it moment, you stand on the precipice of, you know, choosing to take, um, 
Now, in this case, neither was probably easy in this case, but choosing the, the path uh, chosen for you, no, not chosen for you, the path uh, everyone wants you to take or your path, right? Someone else's path versus your path. I guess that's, that's a good way to put it. So she has this fuck it moment. And again, we win because of the choice she made. We get to watch her stand up and talk about it. Um, and I always say, like, these moments I've said to, to you guys before, it's better to have a lot of those fuck it moments early than a few of them late. Right? No. The other way around. Uh, mix that up. A few fuck it moments early, when you make the right decision, it prevents you having a lot of those fuck it moments late when you are in a position of, oh my god, what have I been doing? Right? Like, yeah. Um, that's how the, a midlife crisis happens. That's why we have them. That's why it's a thing. Especially, I don't, I don't know if midlife crises is, 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 are things around the world in other cultures. Here it is. Why? Because we make the wrong decision when we have a fuck it moment. For the most part. Until we get to a point where we have to say fuck it, but we're not equipped. Right? So you make a choice to be something, sort of go a certain path, and you just put your head down, put the blinders on, just sort of push your way through, and then you wake up and you're 46, and you hate what you do, and you're pissed about your life, and you that's when not that's not the time to have the fucking <laughs> moment because then yeah you're just in too deep you're not equipped to sort of deal with the consequences of that if that makes any sense of I don't know if it does um but she kind of in this process I'm sure like I guess it's sorry about the nose thing. It's sort of a laugh at my pain, laugh with me, laugh at my, it's kind of a laugh at my pain thing, right? To connect with a prior in some way. She exposes the comedian's dream in this case, if we want to use that as a, in, as a um, version of the American dream, right? Like we talk about this, like, especially in the 80s, comedian's sort of map, roadmap was start doing stand up get good enough to do like 45 minutes of shit you don't care about have a scout or a agent or a producer or direct whatever see you have them create a show around your act do the show get a movie like that was the the mainstream dream as Carlin talked about she exposes it because she did all that and she got to the TV part and it was a complete nightmare. It was nothing what she thought it would be. And it was brutal. Physically, mentally, emotionally brutal. And um, the, the chase of that dream made for a lot of shitty comedy. Right? We talked about Bill Hicks. Like Comedy was the end for Bill Hicks. He didn't want anything other than to be you know, some, an iconic stand-up comedian. But for most of the other comedians in the 80s, it wasn't that. There was a handful that were really popular. We kind of touched on them. But the rest of them just worked in the clubs. They're just like, I just need to put my head down, plaster on a smile, and do this 45 minutes until somebody notices me and gives me a ton of money to make a TV show. So like, if that's why you're invested in it, if that's why you're doing it, I mean, why would it be any good? Why would it mean anything to anybody? Right, so that whole comedian's dream, the mainstream dream, made for a lot of shitty comedy in the 
is. Um, and Margaret Cho kind of got out ahead of it, right? So this was 1991, I think her show was premiered. And it did one season, it was gone. And she, you know, she kind of tells you about all that stuff. Um, and I mean, I'm gonna keep connecting her, just connected her to Pryor, and connect her to Cosby. Um, she's another figure that refused to give people the, the Asian that they want, the Asian American that they want and are comfortable with. Like that's kind of a trend that we're, we're starting to see. These kinds of people don't want to just fall in line. They don't want to be the stereotype. They want to cut against it. They want to dismantle that whole structure. Um, and this is the thing, like she talks about this a lot. Like the little girl who wrote the letter, like when I see Margaret Cho on TV, I feel shame like for my people. Like you're like, oh, that one hits a lot different. And for some reason, this makes us angry when you don't conform to your stereotype that makes us either nervous or upset or angry or unsettled or afraid i don't know what it is but that's kind of how that goes down when someone transgresses their race or this you know the stereotype of their race we yeah we're opposed to that for the most part just do you but who defines you me <laughs> i'm not making any sense i'm very tired but sometimes that's the best time to make videos for your class um sort of that and i talk about this too with not just asian americans any minority women uh, homosexuals african americans like how much of my this idea of how much of myself do i have to give up today right to fit into whatever situation might be uh, i might be presented with um and that's a cruel thing to have to to deal with and have to ask yourself daily. Um, the whole, the whole not Asian enough, like it's, it's baffling that that, all of that transpired. You're not Asian enough. <laughs> like, and the Asian consultant, and now, like, it is surreal. Like, hearing her say that stuff for the first time, you're like, fuck you. Like, no way. But at the end of the day, again, it, she was presented with the fuck it moment. Yeah, she tried to conform. It, it really set her back. Like, with the body, the body image stuff, and her, cra she went on these crazy diets to be, because she thought she was too heavy, and, her face was too round, like those, all those kind of criticisms. You know, just change your face a little. Um, but inevitably, it led to her embracing herself over everything, which we win as a result, right? Um, and I think she did say she won as a result. It forced her to, number one, find out who she is, because she thought she was a thing and then she got to the pinnacle of that thing and was like oh this isn't who i am carlin did the same thing right he was doing the thing he thought he was but there was a undertone of i'm faking it here this isn't me like i'm counterculture i'm not culture i'm counterculture i need to experience this and that's kind of that's my Another, that's a connecting to uh, Pryor, Cosby, and Carlin. Um, 
So that's always interesting um, to, to see that play out. Um, she, she basically, the mistake she made was compromising herself, right? Like, I think that's one of the takeaways. The biggest mistake she made in her life was the period of time when she compromised herself for the, the good of, I don't know, like her career, whatever it was, um, and her connection to fresh off the boat, right? That whole joke about, you know, I was so bad, they needed an entire generation to, to grow up before they could have another Asian American family on TV. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's interesting things going on there too. Um, she gets a lot of, I don't know, like conflicting criticism about using her mother's voice, like doing that stereotypical Asian voice for laughs. Like, but I think again, I think a lot of you've mentioned this in your comments. Like, you can tell the difference. Like, she's not using it to be like, "Oh, my mother talks so weird," and isn't she a piece of shit as a result? <laughs> That's not the point of it. I think she uses it to talk about her sexuality and this generation gap and things like that. And she uses it to, you know, illuminate bigger ideas. It's not just doing the voice to do it, right? Um, does something with the voice that's more than the voice. Um, take us to other ideas and jokes that don't have anything to do with the voice. Um, I think that's a, a development uh, that you don't necessarily see so often. And she gives us some insight, right? Like she kind of has some a different perspective on doing those jokes, um, but they don't feel cheap. I don't think it doesn't feel like a gimmick. Um, giving she talks about giving voice to silenced communities, right? The Asian community, the uh, the female community and you know the LG, uh, LGBTQ community. It's you know there was a need for voices. Like that's such a powerful thing statement that she makes in that little documentary at the beginning, the first thing that we watched. Um. And she chose comedy, right? Like comedy is. A place for voices. The Hicks documentary, right? Richard Jenny says comedians are one of the few professions or people who have a license to tell the truth. He's like, too few of us do. I take the opportunity to do it. Bill Hicks did, and he's my rich heir. Certainly, now I'm comparing him to Hicks. <laughs> um, she talked about fa failure gave her a purpose, right? I think that goes back to what I was talking about before with, you know, she needed to get to that point. You know, at some point, you got to be honest about who you are. The, the earlier you can do that, the quicker you can do that, the happier your life is going to be. And that's just, that's for all y'all out there listening and watching this. That's just true, whether you're a famous comedian or if you're just, you know, in an age dev. Like, who are you? And an intimate understanding, not just this like, oh, I'm a BU student. And no, no, like, really, in here, who are you? And when you can identify that, the rest of your life is, you know, is a, 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 it's a cakewalk. And she realized that. And she was pretty young, early 20s. And she's, she had a lot of struggles coming out of it. But it was that I'm going to succeed as myself that, you know, I think drove her and pushed her through it. Um, 
trying to fit in like an asshole. Assholes try to fit in, right? Like, and that, but that's what she thought she had to do was fit in when it was sitting there waiting the whole time for her. You know, her identity was to not fit in by any means. Um, and then I showed the interview segment at the end just to just sort of you know, wind it back to what we were talking about, like, you know, contempt, like Carlin was kind of the first, maybe prior to two, but he yeah, a little bit like started, we started to look to comedians as like, what are your thoughts on these real world issues? And yeah, as thinkers and as philosophers, if you will. So you know, all this recent stuff with um, Asian violence against Asian Americans and, and racism towards that community, you know, she's been on talk shows and yeah, we want to hear your insight, your perspective. And it's, it's funny. <laughs> so, um, oh, what's the one thing? Yeah. She talks about the model minority label and how really flawed that is and deceptive it can be and how, you know, like sneaky limiting it can be to to people to especially to asian americans um i thought that was interesting like breaking that and breaking that down um and it's the whole story about how um south korea issued an apology to like the United to the world that the Virginia Tech shooter was from was South Korean descent. Like that's insane. And I think I think it goes back to like Caitlin talked about collectivism. We'll get to that more. But like, imagine if we white in America felt that kind of shame and embarrassment every time there was a, a white person that shot up a school or whatever. Can you imagine that? I mean, you obviously can't imagine that. That's what imagination is, but um, like, yeah, get me some of that action. Um, so let's, let's get to your comments. Let's see what you guys have to say about Margaret Cho. Um, Eliana, Eliana compared her to Bruce. So now we're Bruce Pryor, Carlin Hicks. We've connected her to. Um, and some of you connected her to Ellen as well. And that Nah, not so much by their similarity, but their differences, especially the way they approach, approach their sexuality and things like that. But um, like Bruce, the first, is, uh, someone mentioned this maybe in the documentary, the first person through the breach, right? The first person to push through the door, or knock down the wall, is the one to break through, right? Is the one that often takes the most bullets. So here she is, and I, I really didn't think about it in this context. Like she, and there, there may, there, I'm sure there are others, but she's the first Asian American comedian that broke through, right? One of the first Asian American performers to break through who wasn't doing like you know kung fu movies or you know to be, yeah. Um, she was one of those. She was one of the first. And she used that platform. And she... So, she took a lot of heat. You know? 
took a lot of bullets for it. Um, Elizabeth kind of mentioned this too, made a connection to Lenny Bruce. Drew used, you used the term after her failed acting career. And that just hit me wrong. Because I don't think she was a bad, her acting career failed. I think acting, I think the industry failed. The acting industry, Hollywood, failed her. For sure. I mean, and I, you probably didn't mean it that way. Like, oh, she sucked so bad. She thought... I think it's an important distinction to make, like, that she succeeded, right? She got the show. She did a season of the show. But it's the, you know, the industry failed her, not her acting career, you know, if that makes any sense. Um, and then you, Drew continued to talk about how she turned the focus on the stereotypes, not the people who embody them. I think that's an important point to make. Um, in much the same way that Chappelle did when his show came out, which was about the same time, early 2000s, is when Cho started really doing more of this kind of, of uh, material. And that's, you know, for the Asian community, now we're comparing her to Dave Chappelle, I guess. <laughs> so she's, yeah, she's, I, I, I wrote this down. She's the Q. The LGBTQ, right? Queer, which is, I like, I like her description of that. Like, queer is just sort of like, we, we need to occupy this word and take it away from people who want to disseminate it negatively. Um, so yeah, you know, everyone, LGBT, everyone's like, oh yeah, I, I know all those, but you don't, you don't hear of too many cues, if that makes any sense. Um, so I think that's pretty exciting. Um, Allison G A R I T Y Gray. Um, and a, a couple of you others talked about this, like she acknowledged what made her different, embraced what made her different, which is so not a typical Asian. Um, and I think Allison was talking about it in reference to Ellen. Um, the whole point was to, for Ellen was to normalize her sexuality and be like, see, I do the same things you do, and, you know, we can get through this if you just fucking let go of all your bullshit. And Cho was like, no, here's here's how I'm different. This is why I love that I'm different. And, you know, I worked too hard to be the same as everybody else before realizing that being different and being myself is the best way to go. Um, so acknowledging what makes her different is, you know, fantastic. Um, Logan brought up the way she uses her platform. This is what I talked about with comedians. It's like opportunity versus responsibility, right? You don't have a responsibility to do any of this, to make any sort of change or any kind of statements, political or, or sexual or racial, whatever whatever it is you don't have the responsibility that is not technically your job but you do have the opportunity so if you're not taking the opportunity why is that it's because you're afraid of the bottom line you lose fans you lose it, or is it because i don't know um all you want is the money all you care about is making money or being famous, or whatever it is, like, those seem to be some shallow things, shallow things to sort of guide your life by. So using your platform to make these kinds of statements, and these kinds of jokes, and, and interviews, and things like that. Um, Parth talked about 
blending commentary with jokes, right? And this, again, this is a style that had kind of gone away in the 80s, right? And Hicks seemed to sort of the reset button. Hicks kind of brought it back. Um, and it's more, there's more of that comedy now than that. So just blending those two things. Cole, um, now I talked about this earlier. Cole mentioned the need for voices, right? Like that's such a, I think a powerful term. Like that seeing the need for voices and then not just seeing it, but becoming one of becoming a voice for the voiceless. In this case, you know, people dying of AIDS and and um, just marginalized communities in general. Um, so I like the need for voices thing. Um, Jake, Jake talk just mentioned how. Um, mentioned how Jimmy Yang's uh, sort of paid homage to her um, Jake Jimmy Yang sort of pays homage to her. Oh yeah, Jake, right there. Um, and the, the power and the resonance of her stuff, I thought that was a cool little footnote kind of thing. Um, and then Ben using race to connect, right? Uh, this idea that this is kind of cool. We only differ by the things we can't control. So like our race, we can't control it. Who our family is, we can't control it. Like those kinds of things. Um, and that's an interesting distinction. Um, and then Caitlin talked about um, addresses overarching problems, systemic problems, like things of uh, that Asian Americans face. But the idea of collectivism and how you know it's a cultural thing. That idea of collectivism where it's the greater good and for the most part like less focus on the individual like that's certainly not what happens in this country so those are culture clashes that you know Asian Americans have to deal with um, more often than pretty much anybody else um, Asian enough, this was Caitlin too, Asian enough ironically means um, stereotypical enough, right? So like the whole you're not Asian enough basically me is a, you, you should you should want to be not Asian enough, right? It's, <laughs> it's a good thing to not abide by every single stereotype and try to fit into every single stereotype. The more we transgress those stereotypes, I think the more difficult they are to levy against entire groups. Um, so I thought that was a good point. And then Jack, finally, I know I'm running long a little bit here, but Jack's point about how she felt neither Asian nor white, right? Like, um, or American, I guess, in this case. And how that can be a real mind fuck, you know, which community am I identifying with? And it's, you know, more parallels between Chappelle and Cho, right? The racial draft sketch. If you've ever seen the racial draft sketch by the Chappelle show, it's basically there's so many mixed race people and celebrities, so it's it's time we choose, right? So each community is like drafting, you know. Um, like Tiger Woods, right? 
African Americans draft Tiger Woods number one. So he's no longer considered of Asian descent as well. Um, but that whole having to choose and trying to sort of grapple with that. So I'm glad you guys got something good out of Margaret Cho because she's awesome. And, ooh, awesome. That's the word. That's the bonus word for today. Use the word awesome in your uh, comment on this post. And extra credit. Bye.